Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Rung Week in Review. This show was recorded on September 11, 2023. I'm Aspet Bedrosian. I'm here with Hovik Manucharian. And here are our major topics today. We're going to talk about developments in Artsakh. And as the parliament elected a new president there, we'll ask how Samvel Shahramanian's tenure can advance the cause of Artsakh. We'll talk about geopolitics in the South Caucasus. We'll seek to understand better and why the EU policy towards Artsakh and the whole South Caucasus seems to be shifting towards an effectively anti-Armenian stance. We'll also touch upon the festering Armenian-Russian relations in this context. To talk about these issues, we have with us Dr. Benjamin Borosian, who is a senior fellow at APRI Armenia, a Yerevan-based think tank. He's also the chairman of the Center for Political and Economic Strategic Studies. Hello and welcome, Benjamin. It feels like we haven't talked for a while. Happy Monday evening, everyone. Hello, Aspet. Hello, Hovig. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Yes, I think yes, we indeed. didn't speak for one and a half months or two months, and a lot have happened during these two months. Yeah. Okay. Well, so let's get going. Okay. Um, so let's begin with Artsakh. Over the weekend, the parliament in Artsakh elected a new president to replace Arey Karasunyan, who had resigned a week earlier. Uh, Samvel Shahramanyan is an ally of a former president, Bako Sahakyan, and has led the Artsakh Security Council during Karasunyan's presidency. Uh, Shahramanyan stated that, that Artsakh must get international status and must be connected via the Bertor Lachin corridor to Armenia. We've all seen the videos of him already taking his oath, and it was pretty uh, impressive to me personally. But uh, Benjamin, what can be expected from Shah Ramanian's presidency? What do you like, or what are the risks, or you know, what are, what are some potential developments from this election? We know that Azerbaijan did not like this very much. Definitely, Azerbaijan did not like this. What we can expect? I believe the key here is that we have a person who hopefully can take action. Because the primary problem with Mr. Ray Karitunyan was that for whatever reasons, at least in the last nine months, starting from December 2022, when Azerbaijan imposed the blockade, Mr. Karitunyan was not able to take actions. I'm not speaking even right actions, wrong actions, but somehow it was a stalemate in Karabakh. People were sitting and waiting, I don't know for what. Maybe there were some hopes that international community like the EU, US, I don't know, Russia or anybody will force Azerbaijan to end the blockade, but there were no actions. Wait, wait, uh, but are you saying that having a sit-in on a plastic chair in front of his office was no action? Come on. Uh, okay, uh, for me it was zero action because <laughs> let's not forget that president is also commander of chief according to Karabakh constitution. And we all know okay. that every moment Azerbaijan may launch large-scale attack against Karabakh. This is very real. And if the commander-in-chief telling that the maximum which I can do is to launch a sitting strike or hinting that, okay, after sitting strike, maybe it could be hunger strike or whatever else, uh, this cannot be perceived as a as any action. So here now we have a new president who came from security apparatus. According to his biography, I believe he was worked in different uh, law enforcement bodies, including police. But then he was the director of National Security Service 2018-2020 during the last two years of Bakos Alakian presidency. Then he was a minister. Then starting from January 2023, he was a secretary of Security Council. So I hope personally that some actions can be taken uh, regarding his speech in the parliament. I believe this was very interesting because uh, what Mr. Sharamanyan said that first, he said that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh at least is a disputed territory, and Nagorno-Karabakh should have relevant status. Then he said about direct communication with Armenia. He said that uh, Karabakh is ready to start negotiation with Azerbaijan. And he said that, okay, you may ask what should be the end game of negotiations. And he said, yes, yes, Artsakh should have clear vision of end game, what the negotiations should be. And he said that the end game is to keep Artsakh Armenian and transfer Armenian Artsakh to next generations. These are uh, very sober statements because uh, he didn't speak that, okay, uh, Artsakh should be, become part of Armenia, we should take back all territories which we lost during uh, 2020 war. This was clear statement at first, Artsakh should have a status, what status, okay, can be discussable. Second, that the end game of Artsakh 
during the negotiation with Azerbaijan is to keep Artsakh Armenian and to transfer Armenian Artsakh for the future generations. These are important messages also for international community telling that, okay, uh, the new leadership in Artsakh, they are not detached from reality and they are not telling that, okay, look, within six months, we will restore the borders of Artsakh as of September 26, 2020. So my understanding right. is that the new leadership is understand what the situation is. And the situation is, okay, if I will say situation is very bad, I believe well, everybody knows that. Situation is very close to catastrophe. And every moment, just every single moment, Azerbaijan may launch a large-scale attack against uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. This threat is also very real. And here we have a person who does not uh, speak science fiction. He says that, okay, guys, at the moment, at least Nagorno-Karabakh should have status. And this can be interpreted in many ways. I'm not going to go into d details. What does it mean? Karabakh should have relevant status. I may understand this in a A way. Someone may say, no, I understand this as a B way or C way. But the key thing is that there is a new leadership who is capable and ready, at least according to my understanding, to take steps and to take actions. And these are people who are not detached from reality. And they understand that to speak about science fiction and some patriotic speeches will uh, not prevent catastrophe. The key task of the new leadership, and as far as I understand, yes, uh, Mr. Sharamayan has close connection with former President Bako Saakyan. At the end of the day, he served two years as a director of National Security Service during Mr. Saakyan's presidency. My understanding is that uh, Mr. Ruben Vartanian also supports him. So we have a person who is ready to take actions and we have a person who is uh, ready to assess situation very soberly and again his key task is to prevent catastrophe because if Azerbaijan launches large scale attack against Nagorno Karabakh Republic uh, I'm afraid implications will be catastrophic Benjamin when you talk about the status that they refer to do you think that is a status inside Azerbaijan a protected status to keep Artsakh Armenian okay the key thing is that uh, this is very vague and this is very good because look what is Azerbaijan as far as i understand telling to international community they are telling that look nagorno karabakh armenians behave like we are in september 2020 or we are in august 2019 that they are detached from reality they uh, rejected uh, to understand that 2020 war have significantly changed the balance of power in South Caucasus in general, and also situation around Nagorno-Karabakh. And we remember the law of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic about occupations that every territory which Azerbaijan took during 2020 war is now occupied territories of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, that is, the territory should be returned. All this sounds very nice for every Armenian, but this is a detached from those reality which Nagorno-Karabakh is now. When people are very close to die from hunger, and not like in a poetic way, like exaggerations, tens of thousands of people, if not 120,000 people, are very close to die from hunger. So in this situation, I think it's a very right wording that Nagorno-Karabakh should have relevant status, and uh, our end game is to keep Artsakh Armenian. Uh, but I believe that in this case, this is very, uh, the right thing is to uh, use vague words, which give you some room of m maneuvering. And also, let's see what will be international community reaction and what will be Azerbaijan reaction. My understanding is that uh, this speech of Mr. Shahramanyan was definitely translated into Russian, English, I don't know, French, Azerbaijani, and have been studied very carefully to understand that, okay, what new leadership initial positions are. Yeah, uh, speaking about the reactions, if you don't mind, I'll take us a little bit forward. In conjunction with David Ishanian from the ARF as Speaker of the National Assembly in Artsakh, they also have uh, probably more legitimacy than Alek Harutsunyan had. And uh, you mentioned two of the three, I think, statements that he uh, he said, the principles. And, uh, but one thing that is really interesting is that Thing. I mean, uh, regarding the international and specifically EU uh, reaction, uh, I think we can safely say that overall the EU, the US, the Russians have essentially endorsed Azerbaijan's proposal that 
aid uh, should begin to flow through the Agdam or Akna road. And then a day later, uh, the Lachin corridor uh, might be opened in quotes as a way to solve the current problem where basically Artsakh is completely blockaded. More importantly, concerning the elections, uh, the EU last weekend found itself in an interesting company like Azerbaijan, Turkey, uh, the Organization of Turkey States, the UK, Ukraine, and others who explicitly condemned the elections or at a minimum stated that they don't recognize the results. And also it's important to note with regard to the opening of the uh, corridors that Azerbaijan basically perceives the opening of the Berzor or Lachin corridor as a return to the state uh, previous to June 15 when Azerbaijani border guards were manning a checkpoint on the Hakari Bridge. Meanwhile, the checkpoint itself is effectively a a blockade. It is the blockade. Uh, It is being used to kidnap Armenians and presents challenges to delivery of aid and movement of people with the aim of of making basically life untenable and essentially forcing Armenians to flee Artsakh. And to top off this news uh, about the checkpoint, there was news that the Armenian side had accepted a plan to allow a single Russian truck via Agdam Akna. But that also apparently fell through in the end because the Azerbaijani side didn't honor its part of the deal. What caused Azerbaijan to back out of this apparent previous agreement to send a Russian aid truck to Akna? And are you aware of Azerbaijan's explicit goals and conditions attached to this reopening? First of all, uh, regarding the Azerbaijani checkpoint on Lachin Corridor, for me, it's crystal clear that only way to move this checkpoint is a military way, like simply to destroy this checkpoint through military means. I am more sure that no country is going to do that and no country will do that. Only Armenia can do that. And as far as I understand the policy of current Armenian government, Armenian government will never do that. Armenian government will never, under any circumstances, order Armenian army to destroy this checkpoint, which means that unfortunately we have to accept this checkpoint is going to stay there. We may like it, we may not like it, but checkpoint is going to stay there as far as Republic of Armenian Army will not destroy this checkpoint by military means. And I am afraid this is not going to happen, at least in a short or midterm perspective. Regarding uh, non recognition of elections, all uh, this uh, plethora of bodies, the EU, I don't know, individual countries, OIC, etc., they also issuing such statements before 2020 war, when there was a presidential election in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2007, 2012, 2017, then a constitutional referendum of 2006, constitutional referendum of 2017, we hear the same statements, but it did not prevent, for example, the OAC means group co-chairs to come, sometimes to go to Karabakh or meet with Karabakh leadership in Armenia. So, definitely, This is uh, obvious diplomatic practice that no one can say, yes, I accept the election because anybody who will say I accept elections or uh, I don't condemn the elections, it would mean that they somehow recognizing Nagorno-Karabakh Republic as a state and no one recognized Nagorno-Karabakh as a state. But let's not forget that, for example, in the EU statement, while they were telling that this is unconstitutional or they don't accept the constitutional framework within which elections took place, if I am using precise translation. But also, there was a second part, that at the end of the day, we call uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians to round around de facto authorities who are ready to launch some meaningful discussions or negotiation with uh, Azerbaijan. So We'll continue. We'll actually cover the um, EU-Armenia relationship a little bit in more detail, but I was wondering if you can speak a little bit specifically about the reopening of the Akna Road, and actually, let me also add another question. Well, basically, we want to know what cards Ishkhanian and Shahramanian have in negotiating with Baku and the outside world as well. Okay, what cards they have. First, regarding this situation around Lachin Corridor, Akna Road, or uh, other roads. So, uh, situation has two dimensions. One is humanitarian, to prevent multiple deaths from hunger. But the second dimension is political. From Azerbaijani point of view, starting supply via Agna, or as they are calling Agdam, road to Karabakh, it means that this is another step to integrate Karabakh into Azerbaijani economic area. 
like another step of so-called integration. And I believe that political dimension for Azerbaijan is much more important than humanitarian dimension because definitely Azerbaijan don't care how many people will die in, in Karabakh. But what they care to show that everyone, including Karabakh, accepts the start, at least the start of the process of integration. So this Azerbaijani perspective, supplies should be done also via Agna or Agdam Road. Why? Because this is a step toward integration of Nagorno-Karabakh into Azerbaijan. Uh, definitely, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh are not happy with this perspective. That is why they are telling no, there should be no supplies via Agdam. Now, regarding the Russian offer. So, when a Russian truck uh, with a Russian plate, presumably with a Russian driver, will enter Stepanakert from Azerbaijani territory, I think this is a some solution which potentially could provide face saving for both Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh authorities. Because Azerbaijan may say, okay, the integration of Karabakh into Azerbaijan starts when Nagorno-Karabakh authorities can say, okay, but a Russian truck, a cargo put in this truck by a Russian Red Cross and a Russian driver, this has nothing to do with start of any process of integration of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh into uh, Azerbaijan. So my understanding is that Russians came up with this uh, solution, trying to say, okay, Azerbaijan may say, oh, yes, we reached our goal. At least supply started through Agdam. Nagorno-Karabakh authorities can say, yes, we also reached our goal because the key issue was not cargo, road, Agdam, Akna, or whatever. The key was Azerbaijan attempt to show that this is the start of the process of integration of Nagorno-Karabakh into Azerbaijan. But while accepting this truck with Russian plates, Russian driver, and etc. has nothing to do with integration. Why it did not happen, as far as uh, we have the information, uh, that Azerbaijan suddenly said that no, along with this Russian truck, also these two trucks sent by Azerbaijani Red Crescent, I believe, and these two trucks are in Agdam for the last two weeks, they also should enter, because potentially maybe Azerbaijan understood that if only Russian truck enters, this can be interpreted in different ways, including the way that it has nothing to do with the launch of the process of integration of Karabakh into Azerbaijan. That is why they uh, said no. Right. And they said no. And if these Azerbaijani trucks also enter Stepanakert from Azerbaijani territory, yes, it will be very difficult to reject that this is a start of the process of integration of Nagorno-Karabakh into Azerbaijan economic area. That is why I believe the Nagorno Karabakh authority said no. We agreed to accept Russian truck and we are going to accept Russian truck. No additional Azerbaijani trucks. But again, key here is a political dimension because Azerbaijan key position is this that integration of Karabakh into Azerbaijan should start as soon as possible. And we all know that otherwise Azerbaijan tells that okay, if Nagorno Karabakh is not going to be part of Azerbaijan through peaceful means, then okay, guys, you will have something similar to 2020. Benjamin, as an aside to the Artsakh new presidential election process, we should note that all forces except Samvel Babayan's United Fatherland Party supported Shahramanian's election. Uh, although Babayan congratulated Shahramanian the following day, he supports opening Adam Agna for aid to Artsakh and has argued in the past that Artsakh should offer cooperation with Aliyev to remove Russian peacekeepers, presumably as a negotiation card. Can you explain the Babayan factor in Artsakh politics and also the geopolitics of it? Okay, it's uh, very complicated to give precise assessments, but as far as can I understand, uh, Mr. Babayan more or less tries to push uh, the ideas of current Armenian government, according to which, if Azerbaijan agrees to provide some rights and security to Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, then at the end of the day, Karabakh can be part of Azerbaijan. We know that this is the official position of Armenian government. Armenian government dropped even demand for autonomy for Karabakh within Azerbaijan. No autonomy, no status, only the rights of Armenians in Azerbaijan, which can be interpreted as a vision that, okay, Armenians more or less have some dignified life in Georgia, for example, holding Georgian passports without having any 
uh, administrative autonomy or any autonomy. So the Armenian government vision is that at the end of the day, maybe through international mediation or through international presence, let's make uh, Nagorno-Karabakh similar to Java Hetero region. As you know that officially in Georgia there is no Javak, there is a Java Hetero region, which somehow can be we can compare this with Azerbaijani vision of Karabakh economic region. And our government believes that somehow is it possible to have Armenians with Azerbaijani passport living in Karabakh economic region, but having some rights like to be educated in Armenian language, to have some working Armenian church, etc., etc., etc. Maybe I am wrong, but my understanding is that uh, somehow what uh, Mr. Babayan tries to do is more or less is in line with this position, as far as I understand. Yeah. Benjamin, last time when we spoke about status and some EU officials, actually, this not last time, this was in, uh, sometime early in 2022, you mentioned that uh, you refuse to believe that EU officials could be so stupid to believe that Armenians can live in Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan without a status, without some kind of international protection. So I want to ask you, and and so you, I think you kind of attributed more to willful blindness, you know, about the issue, just in order to push things along. So let me ask you, do you think Samvel Babayan or Nikol Pashinyan legitimately believe that uh, Artsakh can be part of Azerbaijan with some guarantees of status? Uh, as far as I understand our Prime Minister's vision, uh, he believes that with some international presence or some international involvement, it's possible to have Armenians living in Karabakh without having status. At least he publicly says about this. Does he personally believe this or he understands that it's not going to happen? Okay, uh, from my perspective, uh, this is not going to happen. I mean, I don't see any base or any argument or any factor or anything which can give you some reasonable argument that uh, without having status, we are not speaking like independent, but at least without having status inside Azerbaijan, it's possible to have a more or less secure or acceptable life of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. So I believe that this is not going to happen. Maybe Prime Minister thinks that this is the only way to come up with a peace deal with Azerbaijan and then launch normalization with Turkey. I don't know, but this also could be an option that, okay, uh, this is unlikely to happen, but sorry, this is the only way to somehow sign peace agreement with Azerbaijan, then normalization with Turkey, and as our current government speaks, to launch this era of peace in the region. For me, this is a little bit fairy tale, but as we say, every person has the right to have its own vision. I mean, I'm sure I've asked you in the past, but please describe the current position uh, of the EU on Artsakh. Um, when the discussions were about lowering the bar uh, in April 2022, uh, you on one of our previous shows said that the EU supports Artsakh as part of Azerbaijan with Armenians having, quote, some autonomy, unquote. And you also added that either out of stupidity or feigning naivete uh, and believing that this is really possible. Do you believe that even this position, namely granting some autonomy, uh, has changed over time to be even more pro azeri So, starting what uh, EU position in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. So, uh, starting in late 2021, when this Shalmi negotiation process started, first meeting took place in December 2021. I'm not going to mention all meetings. The last one was in July 2023. So, several EU, EU perceptions. Perception number one, especially taking into account the result of the 2020 war, any discussion about Nagorno-Karabakh independence or unification with Armenia is totally detached from reality. And they are counterproductive and will lead to nowhere. This is uh, like presumption number one. Issue number two, Armenians cannot live under Azerbaijani jurisdiction without real and strong international presence on the ground because of many reasons, 35 years of conflict, like a lot of hatred in Azerbaijan towards Armenia, uh, different kind of crimes against hum humanity committed by all sides. So international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh for quite a long period of time, not years, like decade or even decades. This is issue number two. Does it automatically mean 
autonomy or no, no clarity, but at least international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. But issue number third, that the European Union as a body of 27 countries is not in a position to force President Daliyev to accept international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. Why? Because any such decisions in European Union are accepted by unanimous agreement. All 27 states should agree. While Mr. Aliyev has many good friends in different European capitals who will not allow these unanimous decisions are made. So these are the three key arguments or vision from European Union. And the number four is that if Armenia itself dropped demand for autonomy and now speaks only about rights and security, which means that without any status, uh, every person in general, there is a, a universal uh, human rights declaration. So every person, regardless of its citizenship, place of uh, living, etc., etc., has the rights. So if Armenia itself dropped demand for autonomy, dropped demand for status, uh, then definitely the European Union is absolutely not in a position to push this idea forward. Still, you believe that international presence should be there, but again, you cannot force President Daliyev to accept international presence. So what does it mean in reality? In reality, it means that, okay, President Aliyev has his vision of Azerbaijani interests. But according to President Aliyev, any international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh is absolutely against Azerbaijani vital interests. Any autonomy of Nagorno-Karabakh within Azerbaijan is absolutely against Azerbaijani vital interests. That is why President Aliyev rejects this. But, okay, this is Azerbaijan. How Azerbaijan understands its vital interests? But how Armenia understands its vital interests? So if Azerbaijan believes that any status violates Azerbaijan interests, that is why Azerbaijan against this. But if Armenia believes that at least some autonomous status should be for Nagorno-Karabakh inside Azerbaijan is the only way to keep Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, then the question arises why Armenia dropped its demand. Like, there is a misperception and misunderstanding, I believe, outside Armenia. Like, why, if Azerbaijan believes something is against its interests, it can act against uh, that uh, solution. Or, But while Armenia thinks that something is against Armenian interests, Armenia is not able to make any actions to protect its interest or to prevent developments which violates its interest. And uh, this creates some misperceptions that, okay, what Azerbaijan is doing is very clear. It's according to Azerbaijani understanding of Azerbaijani national interest. But um, sometimes there is no clear understanding what Armenia is doing, because sometimes Armenia is doing things which are not in line with its uh, national interest. Interest. Of course, there is a one explanation that Armenia doing this because of threat of war. Like Azerbaijan is telling, okay, do this or accept this or not do this. Yes, it violates your interests. But if you are not doing that, then we will launch large scale war and we will uh, destroy you. So there is a one explanation that what Armenia is doing. Armenia is doing under constant threat of large scale war and invasion and destruction by Azerbaijan. Can this is be fact? Probably yes, this can be fact. But uh, does it justify what Armenia is doing? Okay, we may say that, but the international community should protect Armenia according to international law. Any agreement signed under the threat of use of force is void from legal point of view, according to some Vienna document about international treaties. And all this sounds very well. But in reality, I'm afraid that at the end of the day, people are clearly asking this. Okay, first of all, to somehow prevent catastrophic implications for Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenia should be able to say no to something which is against its national vital interests. Same way as Azerbaijan is telling no to things which, according to Azerbaijan, is against Azerbaijan's vital national interests. For example, international presence in Nagorno-Karabakh. Azerbaijan clearly says no, no, no. Any autonomy for Nagorno-Karabakh is in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan clearly says no 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 so if armenia is not going to clearly say to no 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 
to something which, according to everyone, and also according to Armenia, is directly violates its um, vital national interest. So I'm afraid the international community, even our friends, uh, they are not in a position to support us. I'm not sure if I can uh, share the vision which I get from uh, foreign partners, experts, etc. Benjamin, last week we covered the continuing deterioration of Armenian-Russian relationship, and this week things continued in the same direction. About a week ago, maybe it was 10 days ago, Pashinyan had a lengthy interview with the Italian La Repubblica, where, among other things, uh, he relayed that the Armenian reliance on Russia as a security guarantor was a strategic mistake. And that was just the beginning. The next day, Armenia announced that it was going to participate in military exercises with the U.S. called Eagle Partner 2023. Now, from a military exercise point of view, these don't seem like a very large thing. Two or 300 people are participating only using small arms. Uh, but Russia was deeply offended. They heavily criticized the holding of these military drills, especially in combination with not participating in CSTO exercises. Essentially, they feel like NATO is encroaching on their space in Armenia. Later in the week, Armenia announced that it could be sending aid to Ukraine. Uh, and more than that, Pashinyan's wife was selected to um, send this aid and participate in conferences over there. How do these small, perhaps seemingly unrelated events portend the shifting direction of Armenian geopolitical orientation here? Okay, I'm not sure about geopolitical orientation, but one thing is clear that apparently Armenian leadership decided to do everything to irritate Russia. I'm not sure why, frankly speaking, because it's a little bit strange that from one side, Armenian government is publicly stating that Azerbaijan is preparing attack on Nagorno-Karabakh by concentrating troops around Nagorno-Karabakh, and then accusing Azerbaijan of committing genocide against Nagorno-Karabakh through blockade and creating hunger and humanitarian catastrophe. And now I'm not speaking about potential attack against Armenia, because Azerbaijan concentrates troops also on Armenia-Azerbaijan border, but let's speak about Nagorno-Karabakh. So Armenian government strongly believes that Azerbaijan prepares large-scale attack against Nagorno-Karabakh, presumably to finish the genocide, the genocide which already is underway through blockade and creating hunger and humanitarian catastrophe. All understand that only power which really can prevent attack against Nagorno-Karabakh Again, I'm emphasizing, I'm not speaking about Armenia-Azerbaijan border, attacks against Armenia, etc. I'm only speaking about potential Azerbaijani attack against Nagorno-Karabakh. Only power which is able to prevent this attack on the ground, to prevent, not to criticize it, uh, to make some statements, to call to cessation of hostilities, to condemn Azerbaijan, in uh, Twitter post, X post, or whatever post, to prevent the attack on the ground is Russia. Why? Because only Russia has troops in Nagorno-Karabakh. So here we have some uh, strange contradiction. So Armenian government believes that Azerbaijan is very close to launch attack against Nagorno-Karabakh. Only Russian troops are deployed in Nagorno-Karabakh, who in theory can do something. I'm not in a position to argue that they are going to do something if a large-scale attack occurred. We don't know. Will the Russian peacekeepers do anything? Will there be a direct call from Moscow to Azerbaijan demanding stop? Otherwise, there will be some military actions. We don't know. It may or may not. But at least there are some chances that it, it may happen. There are some chances it may happen. So why would Secretary Blinken issue warning to not use force to resolve issues around Artsakh? Just yesterday, as a matter of fact. Okay, uh, Secretary Blinken may issue whatever statement it wants, but again, if tomorrow Azerbaijan launches large-scale attack against Nagorno-Karabakh, really on the ground, I have great doubts that American troops deployed in Middle East or in Turkey, from Turkey will fly to Stepanakert and fight Azerbaijani troops. Or, I don't know, from Bahrain, from Qatar, from Germany, from Guam, from Hawaii, or whatever... Uh, America has basis. So statements are statements, but development on the ground are development on the ground. Only Russia. Has so why would uh, why would Pashinyan do that then, in your opinion? If 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 okay, uh, it's a very complicated hope. question, and uh, for me, it's very difficult to find any reasonable 
explanation. Either there are something which only Pashinyan knows, which makes uh, my thoughts uh, like a little bit or fully detached from reality. Explanation number one, because uh, definitely we do not have access to full information, especially classified information. Option number one is that there are something which I don't know or other experts don't know, which that is which makes the Pashinyan actions quite uh, reasonable. This is explanation number one. Explanation number two, I have difficulties to find any reasonable explanation number two. Interesting. But again, as the fact is fact that uh, steps have been taken to irritate Russia. And at the end of the day, Russia got irritated because what happened on September 8th, I guess, when our ambassador was summoned to the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And when I read the statement put on the Russian MFA uh, webpage, this was very harsh. And I can imagine what happened in reality, because usually yeah. statements are not as harsh as uh, off-the-record discussions inside uh, closed, behind the closed doors. I even don't believe, and uh, it's difficult for me to remember any statement starting from 1991, when Armenia became independent, this type of harsh statement by Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs against Armenian leadership or against our Armenians. This was very tough. And definitely this was answer to all these uh, events which you mentioned, starting from recalling our ambassador in CSTO and not appointing a new ambassador, cancelling CSTO drills in Armenia, don't participate in CSTO drills in Belarus, I believe, then these uh, drills with U.S., which itself are very small, and definitely they have been agreed quite long uh, before, because you cannot organize drills with uh, U.S., even 85 or 100 U.S. soldiers within several days. I believe that most probably these uh, drills were agreed even in 2022. when. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was a sequence of events uh, with clear aim to irritate Russia, and at the end of the day, at least at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs level, Russia was irritated. And it was interesting that on September 10, I guess, or no, it was September 10, when Pashinyan called almost everyone, like Macron, Schultz, and these guys were sitting in India in G20. Then Raisi, then Blinken, and no call to Russia, while Russia still is number one playing in South Caucasus. Maybe yeah. after this harsh statement of Russian MFA, Pashinyan understood that uh, it's not the right way this time to speak with Mr. Putin. But again, it is also very interesting that Armenia is telling everyone, even today, I think on Monday, on Monday, yeah, there was a phone talk between Erdogan and Pashinyan. So Pashinyan spoke with everyone except Russia. While Russia is a power who has military presence in the region, in Armenia, in Nagorno-Karabakh, and despite all these uh, complications regarding russia west war and military hostilities in ukraine still russia is number one player in the south caucasus i don't think i would be too far in the realm of science fiction if i suggested a scenario what if uh, azerbaijan were in fact to attack and uh, take over Artsakh by force without necessarily killing 120,000 armenian but then you know i'm sure that there would be uh, unfortunate bloodshed would the us and the eu lose anything in a scenario like that and who would be the loser in a scenario like that? Okay, my understanding is that number one loser, of course, will be Armenia or Armenian as a nation, because uh, we all understand that it will be catastrophic. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't believe that Azerbaijan will deliberately kill all 120,000 people. They don't want to be labeled as ethnic cleans cleansers or genocider or whatever else. But uh, definitely. But at Armenian the same time, population... uh, Artsakh won't go down uh, without a fight. Yeah, no. Okay, there will be fight, definitely. We have defense army. I'm not a military expert, but frankly speaking, I don't believe that this fight will continue for months, especially if there will be no military intervention from Armenia. And my understanding is that current government is not going to militarily intervene. So maybe it will be fight for, I don't know, 72 hours, one week, two weeks, I don't know. But this cannot continue too long, because at the end of the day, if we take only Nagorno-Karabakh, and if for some reason Russian peacekeepers will not intervene, but will stay in their barracks, then definitely the game is very clear. As a issue is not if but when. Like uh, it will the resistance will come to end within 72 hours, within one week, within two weeks. Okay, one month, I'm not sure. But even the 
period is not important. The important thing is that at the end of the day, Azerbaijan will win. A civilian population definitely there will this is in civilian population as during every war. And the problem is that even Armenian population has no way to escape. Because at least in 2020, probably we all remember the November 7th when there was a decision to evacuate Stepanakert. And there was a huge uh, line of cars leaving uh, Nagorno-Karabakh via these two highways. Through Karvajar, which still was under Armenian control, and through Berdor. But now even there is no road to escape Artsakh. So it will be simply terrible, catastrophic things. So number one losers will be Armenia and Armenians as a nation. But Benjamin, specifically, I want to know the winner-loser status for the EU, the US, and Russia in a scenario okay, like uh, that? Definitely, a second loser will be Russia because everybody will perceive this as a complete hu humiliation of Russia, even if no Russian peacekeeper is killed by some miracle. And Russian peacekeepers will stay in their barracks seeing how Azerbaijanis are destroying Nagorno-Karabakh, defense army, or even killing some civilians. Everyone, US, EU, even Turkey, I don't know, India, China, Brazil, everyone in the world who has basic understanding of geopolitics, international relations, etc., will perceive this as a complete humiliation of Russia. So definitely Russia is on the loser side if Azerbaijani flag is on Stepanakert. From EU and US perspective, okay, from humanitarian point of view, if you believe that the US and the EU are like champions of human rights, human life, dignity, etc., etc., Maybe there will be some suffering, maybe some uh, high officials will drink one or two shots of whiskey or brandy to overcome their uh, sufferings. But from pure geopolitical point of view, I don't see this is very, in any way, bad for US and the EU. And if, and most probably this will trigger more anti-Russian sentiment in Armenia, because many Armenians will say, okay, what the hell is going on? Russian peacekeepers are there. There is a statement of November 10, 2020. Russian peacekeepers' mandate is still valid because it will expire if it expires only in November 2025. So it will be more anti-Russian sentiments in Armenia that, okay, uh, Russia sold Karabakh. So maybe, definitely, I'm sure there will be discussions that, okay, this was agreed during September 4th, Sochi, Putin, Erdogan meeting. Like, Putin sold Karabakh to Erdogan. So it's time to really leave CSTO, maybe leave the Eurasian Economic Union, to start the process of kicking out Russian military base from Armenia. And all these are good for the United States. I'm not sure from the EU, because the EU is not looking to the South Caucasus only through the lens of its geopolitical rivalry with Russia. But from the United States point of view, more anti-Russian sentiment in Armenia is good for the United States. And we all understand that if, after God forbid, Azerbaijani troops enter Stepanakert, this will not result in the situation when Armenians will say, oh, thank Russia, thank Mr. Putin. This will result in a situation when more Armenians will say that, okay, Russia, once more, Russia shows that it's in reliable partner, that it's our enemy, that it's in alliance with Turkey and Azerbaijan. Putin sold Karabakh because maybe he received something from Erdogan, I don't know, in Syria, Libya, Eastern Mediterranean, grain deal or whatever else. And so, frankly speaking, uh, I believe that if we put aside this humanitarian point of view, then uh, this is quite good scenario for the United States. At least I see this this way. So Benjamin, uh, you are, and I think out of professionalism, you mentioned that you can't think of a reason number two or number three, but I have to be persistent here and say, you know, given what you just said, is it possible that Pashinyan and Aliyev, and I'm sorry to even think about this scenario, are colluding in order to basically kick the Russians out you know, they don't give a damn about uh, Artsakh and the Armenians in Artsakh. They'll maybe find some way to relocate them to Armenia. Is this scenario possible? Because this is the, this is exactly the scenario that Samuel Babayan mentioned, which was to collude with uh, Aliyev and uh, kick the Russians out. Except Samuel Babayan somehow hopes that Armenians will still live in Artsakh after that. Okay, frankly speaking, I don't want even to think that there will be any situation when Armenian and Azerbaijani leaders conclude, especially as of now, when Azerbaijan is clearly uh, starving Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and prepares attacks at least on Nagorno-Karabakh and potentially on Armenia. In this situation, to think that 
there could be any cooperation or agreement or whatever between Armenia and Azerbaijan leadership is to accept that Armenian state is finished and finished completely. Uh, so I don't want even to think about that, that we are finished. Okay. Uh, well, that's enough, I think, for this. Uh, and I appreciate your uh, answers, uh, Benjamin. Uh, you talked several times today about the possibility of war. And I want to maybe ask you one uh, clarifying question about that and, and maybe go a little bit in more detail and then we can continue. As you say that everyone is basically talking about war, the smell of war, as they say, is um, is here. Uh, over the past three, four days, for example, there has been an enormous amount of images and video published by Azerbaijani social media users uh, with apparent branding around this war, including the symbol that they're using similar to the Russians, uh, various analysts, including uh, one we trust, for, for instance, NK Observer on Twitter, are predicting a high level of likelihood for the start of the war. And some are saying that it's going to be much larger than the 44-day war, and this time it will be in Armenia. Because so far, you mentioned Azerbaijan entering Stepanakert, but we didn't talk about uh, the Zangezur Corridor, which on this you know upside-down A uh, that Azerbaijan has chosen for uh, as a symbol, uh, basically that is it is meant to signify the Zangezur Corridor. And of course, there was the Pashinyan, uh, Pashinyan has been warning, uh, you know, Pashinyan has warned, actually, that Azerbaijan is trying to accumulate forces around uh, Artsakh and around the borders of Armenia. Uh, as you said, he's been calling all the leaders, uh, frankly, except not Putin. So how serious do you think is the likelihood? And also, uh, what about Armenia proper? I think, th doesn't Azerbaijan have goals inside Armenia too, not just the uh, conquest of Artsakh? Okay, starting from Azerbaijani goals, uh, definitely Azerbaijan has goals also regarding Armenia. But frankly speaking, I don't see any reason why Azerbaijan now should attack, I'm speaking about large-scale attack Armenia, like trying to occupy entire Sunik or part of Sunik or part of Ayodzor and establish the corridor. Because uh, first, this will be trigger backlash not only from Russia, also from Iran, but also from the US and the EU. Because at the end of the day, you cannot like simply attack another country and simply occupy or annex. Uh, and uh, second, if in Nagorno-Karabakh, as I mentioned, the defense army is not in a position to resist too much against Azerbaijan without external military support, but this is not the case in Armenia. We have army, there is a population there, uh, I don't believe that it will be like uh, catwalk. Like within 48 hours, Azerbaijani troops will take the entire Sunik and they will be finished. No, it will be definitely large-scale warfare. It will be very difficult to explain what the hell is going on. Uh, then uh, you cannot exclude that there will be a regional spillover. Iran may enter the war. Either he may uh, hit Azerbaijanis or theoretically it may enter Nakhajavan. Of course, Iran may also do not enter the war, but nobody knows. Like, it will be very risky. If Iran enters the war, then Turkey may enter the war. We also the warning Israel. from uh, Turkish foreign ministry that if Iran takes action against Azerbaijan, Turkey will support Azerbaijan. So I'm not in a position that the President Aliyev is ready to trigger a regional war, which may end very bad also for President Aliyev himself. Because if bigger actors enter the war, nobody knows how this will end. Even Russia may enter, and this may end very badly also with uh, for Azerbaijan. And it's no one can calculate all possible scenarios. So I don't understand why President Aliyev should take such risk now. So as far as I can understand any logic behind actions, I believe Azerbaijani key task now is finished with Nagorno-Karabakh. And by finishing with Nagorno-Karabakh, they understand that in Stepanakir, there should be Azerbaijani flag the same way as there is Azerbaijani flag in Shushi. And they believe that, uh, okay, they waited three years after the end of 2020 war, hoping that they can reach this through negotiations. I mean, putting Azerbaijani flag in Stepanakert. Now they understand that at least Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians are not going to accept this. And even if somehow Armenia signs peace agreement with Azerbaijan, without any mentioning of this international mechanism on baku stepanakert dialogue, international presence to secure Armenian rights, or even with zero mentions of Armenian rights per se, but again, this will not change the situation of the ground in Nagorno-Karabakh because, okay, Armenian government may sign or may not sign any agreement with Azerbaijan, but Armenian government cannot go to Stepanakert and force people that, okay, 
tear down Nagorno-Karabakh Republic flags and put Azerbaijani flags, tear down your Armenian passport and receive Azerbaijani passports. Simply, it is not going to happen. So from Azerbaijani perspective, okay, uh, there are a few chances that this is going to happen through peaceful negotiations or through peaceful means within a very short period of time because they believe that three years is quite enough. And as they are telling, you are not going to wait for another three, five, seven years because the geopolitical situation globally and regionally is very dynamic. Change may happen. And if uh, now Azerbaijan more or less has a, at least capacity or possibility to attack and finish with Karabakh by uh, force, nobody knows what geopolitical situation or balance of power in the region we will have, for example, in 2028, even in 2025. So somehow my understanding is that Azerbaijan is in hurry. So yes, I believe that the likelihood of large-scale attack against Nagorno-Karabakh is high. All right, let's uh, wrap up our topics here. I'd like to ask each of you if there's been something on your mind this past week that you would like to talk about. Benjamin, what's on your mind? Okay, I would like to speak not about geopolitics, but I know the situation is too tense, and not to speak about geopolitics, but what I would like to say is that the political changes which happened in Nagorno-Karabakh gives little hope that it will there is a possibility to avert the catastrophe. The hope is little, but my perception is, my understanding is that if nothing happens in Nagorno-Karabakh, a catastrophe was coming by 100%. Now, at least there are some chances to uh, avoid this. And uh, let's see. Hovik, what's on your mind? I, I had a few things to talk about, but I think that drawing from all the conclusions from our discussion today, it's hard for me to fathom any scenario where Azerbaijan, for instance, occupies Artsakh and it doesn't, you know, spill over into anything large. You know, I think just the only thing that we forgot to mention or I forgot to ask is whether there will be a scenario where there are hundreds of thousands or, you know, 100,000 refugees in Armenia from Artsakh and Pashinyan is able to keep his head attached. I somehow, I mean, despite all the disappointments I've received over the last years uh, about, you know, how low this regime can go, I don't see that happening. So if this is really, uh, and and that, in my opinion, signifies the end of Armenian statehood. Uh, and if, if we really are uh, on the precipice of something like that happening, then, you know, why does Pashinyan even decide to keep uh, staying in power? I mean, that's, uh, it's, it just seems like a very um, lose-lose situation for everyone. Maybe he could do the same thing that Arayik did and still survive. I'm not sure. All right. We're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, Benjamin, for joining us. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure as always. That's our show this week. We hope you found it useful. Please follow us on social media. We'll talk to you next week.